want to say Merry Christmas to all of you. And also Merry Christmas to those that are on Zoom this morning. Carol, I like your sweater. Yes. Uh, and also for those that will be watching, are, are you doing YouTube? Okay, for those that will be watching YouTube later, um, those that are watching YouTube later, be sure that you go and that you read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. So if you're watching on YouTube, stop now, read Luke 2, 1 through Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, because we're not going to be reading that, but that's already been read. And I want to thank Anna and uh, Emily and Jenna. I looked at the right ones too, didn't I? <laughs> yes, as I said that, uh, thank you for the reading this morning. Um, and I hope everybody's had a great morning. I hope, uh, I don't know... It was, it's a little different around our house now uh, without little ones and stuff like that. We actually get to sleep just a little bit, uh, except for Sherry. I mean, she has been bugging me for, I don't know, almost two weeks now. Uh, can we open up one present? Can we open up one present? You know, and stuff. I'm serious. I mean, she's really like that. So it, so it still makes a lot of fun around our house because I have to go, no, Santa has not come. That is fake stuff underneath the tree there. So... So anyway, a lot of fun, and I hope all the families have had a lot of fun, and maybe uh, for the families that are not able to watch right now, uh, that you're able to watch a little bit later. Um, have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus could choose anywhere in the world that he wanted to be born? He could have chosen anywhere. He actually could have chosen uh, any date to be born. He could have chosen any parents that he had wanted to be born to. He could, have, he could have chosen everything about his birth, which he did. And so when I was thinking about that, I got to thinking as we were reading the original Christmas story, uh, particularly Luke's account, chapter 2, 1 through 20. Why? Why did Jesus choose to be born in Bethlehem? And, and, and really, when you, when you think about our lesson two weeks ago, uh, since I wasn't here last week dealing with COVID. Uh, let me just say a word about that right quick also. Uh, I'm not going to be able to shake your hands. I really don't need to be hugging you. You don't need to be hugging me. We really don't need to be hugging each other. I know, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was wanting to give a fist bump. Some people grab my hand and they go, hey, I'm good with it. Well, you know, that's good, but that's not good. All right. Uh, we really do need to look out for one another. I know there are others that are struggling right now. I had 104.1 fever, uh, anywhere from 102 to 104.1 for about three days. Every four times I've gotten COVID, mine has run the same course for the four days. I could tell Sherry every day this last time what was going to happen the next day. And after the third day, the fever breaks. It just soaks my pillow, soaks the whole bed, it soaks everything. And, uh, and so she's washing everything, and I said, okay, I'm, I'm just going to let you know it's going to do it again tonight. Uh, and that's what mine has done two nights in a row. Uh, my fever breaks, and it kind of soaks everything for a couple of nights. So I'm just saying, you know, I mean, this is only my third, I think, or fourth time I've been out in two weeks. And two of those times I've been to doctors. Uh, so, so anyway, and I don't have a tan. I haven't I been to Florida, anything like that. I don't have a sunburn. But the medication they're giving me to dry up the sinus infection and to dry up the ear infections, they told me to do for about probably a couple of months. Uh, take a Zyrtec uh, for a couple of months every night. And I'm telling you, that stuff, I think it's drying me out along with the heaters. I don't know. Anybody else running your heater this week? You know, yeah. Uh, so, so anyway, and I've got a lot of, I've got a ton of lotions and creams on and stuff. But uh, uh, 
Uh, Sherry said, hey, just tell them you've been to Florida or something. I go, well, I don't think that's going to work. So anyway, so let me get back to, to, to the sermon here. You know, why, why Bethlehem? Why, why did Jesus choose Bethlehem? Why did God choose to be born in the city? A bit, and really not a city. Why did he choose this hamlet, this village? Uh, I was trying to find out what the, the population would be of Bethlehem uh, at the time of Jesus' birth. And, and the figures that I've seen is anywhere from maybe like 300 to maybe 1,000 uh, at the most. Uh, so somewhere 1,000 and below was, was how many people were living in Bethlehem. Uh, they were under Roman occupation at this time. Uh, Bethlehem was a city that was not walled. It, it, was a, it was this village that was not walled. And, and so you wonder, why not a place like Jerusalem, just five miles to the north, why did he not choose Jerusalem? Why did he not choose the holy city? Why did he, why did he not choose uh, where, where, the, where the throne was, where the king reigned, since he was the coming king? Why did he not choose the temple where the temple was? And, and why did he not choose the family that was of the Levite, the tribe of Levi, the, the, the priestly tribe? Why did he not choose somebody like this? Why did he choose somebody like Joseph and Mary that we talked about two weeks ago? And if you think about that, all of the chaos that was associated with that, all of the, the scandal, that was a very scandalous thing with the birth of Jesus, that Jesus, why would he choose to be born into a mess and creating a mess for Joseph and Mary and not just for them, but also for himself. Why would he choose this? And the reason is, it's because he chose to be born into our mess. He chose to be born into our scandals. He chose to be born. Sherry was talking to me about this this morning, about the, the census, you know, the fact that I, I, I really had not even thought about this, but, but during the census, can you imagine how busy everything was hustling and bustling, and even as Joseph and Mary made that 80-mile trek from, from Nazareth, to the north, all the way down to, uh, to Bethlehem, about an 80-mile trek. And all of these, all these people were coming to their, to their places to, to be able to take this census that, that, that the Roman emperor had decreed. So there was all of this hustle, all of this bustle. Matter of fact, there wasn't even room for them at the place that they were planning to stay. There was no room for them there to be able to have a baby. So that's why they went out to where the, the animals were. That's why they went out to the cave where, where there was this manger, where there was this feeding trough that probably wasn't out of wood, but, but was more than likely out of rock for Mary to be able to have this baby. So all of this hustle, all of this bustle, and I don't know about anybody else, are you ready to kind of exhale a little bit, kind of go... All the parties, all the gift buying, all the gift giving, running here, running there, delivering gifts here, delivering gifts there, the food, you know, all, I mean, all, I love all of that, but, but you know, it gets kind of busy, doesn't it? And that's the kind of world that Jesus chose to be born into. You know, Micah, in Micah chapter 5, actually it prophesied 700 years earlier that Bethlehem was going to be where Jesus the King was going to be born. And I was just reading a little bit, uh, Micah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and, and I think it really speaks a lot of things because in Micah, Micah was, was a prophet of God writing around 700 years before Jesus' birth. And, and he was dealing with both the northern kingdom of Israel and also talking to the southern kingdom of Judah. And, and when you look at both of these and you look at the whole book of Micah, I mean, the people, they were so full of, there was so much oppression. 
But there was so much pride and so much greed and so much corruption with the people. There was this false piety that, that we're God's people, that we're worshiping God, and, and they're going through the motions of their worship, but their hearts were so far from God. And there was this arrogance among them. And so Micah, in, Micah, uh, in, this, in this book here, he's writing to the people of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and he's summoning the priests, and he's summoning their leaders that, hey, you all need to get together, and you need to return back to God. You need to repent and come back to God because God is bringing judgment on you if you do not repent and it's even as Micah talks about this when you get to chapter 5 Micah makes it very clear though that God's love never dies God's love never dies so good having Ellery with us I, every time I look at you, Ellery, I still remember the morning that you were baptized. I, that is something that will be embedded in my mind until the day that I'm with Jesus. But I'm going to ask you a question. Do you remember that day? It felt so good, didn't it? And so clean. So I'm going to ask you a question, and, and you don't have to don't have to go into. But so, have you messed up since then? Some. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can remember, you know, when I was baptized back in 1968. Wow, Ice Age, right? I can remember that after I came up out of that, I felt so good. I felt so clean. And I made up my mind, I am not going to sin. I am not going to sin. I can remember... Probably in my little mind, probably I, uh, at 13 years old, probably I, I had sinned and didn't even know it or whatever, but I thought I made it through about thir three-fourths of that particular day without sinning. And I can remember when I sinned finally. And I thought, man, it broke my heart. Then I thought, wow. Man, you're such a sinner. Well, I've got a lot of mileage behind me now. All of us do. But you know the wonderful news about the coming of Jesus, his birth into our world, and especially as we look at his coming into Bethlehem and, and what Micah was saying there, he made it clear, clear that God's love never ends. It never quits. Even with these people, and when you read this in Micah, I mean, maybe this week, sit down and read the book of Micah. There's only uh, seven chapters, so it's not a whole lot. Just look at their lives. Look at their mess. But in Micah chapter 5, here, here's what he says to them. He goes, mobilize. Marshal your troops. You know why Micah says that to them? He's saying that to them because they have always trusted their army. They've always trusted their military might. God's people, man, it's our military. Man, we've got power. Nobody's going to push us around. And so Micah, he's saying, you know what? Go ahead, mobilize your troops. The enemy is laying siege to Jerusalem. And this actually took place around 605 B.C., whenever Nebuchadnezzar came in uh, from, from the Babylonian Empire and he laid siege to the city of Jerusalem back in the days of Daniel. And you can read about this in the book of Daniel, but you can also read about this in first, uh, 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. And, and he's saying the enemy is laying siege to Jerusalem. So about a hundred years after Micah wrote these words, warning them of what was going to happen, it happened. And he says they're going to strike Israel's leader. In other words, you're trusting your king? You're trusting a Jehoiakim back in Daniel's day, but also Zedekiah? You're trusting these kings to save you? Well, I'm going to tell you something. This enemy, they're going to strike your leader in the face with a rod. But you, 
O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. But you, O Bethlehem, this little village, you're the smallest of all villages. And again, it is not a walled village. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. In other words, he's saying in Bethlehem, there's going to come a ruler. There's going to come a king from the distant past. I mean, from all eternity. And he's going to come to you. He's going to come to us. Because do you realize that whenever Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem, first time in 605 B.C., there was never, ever another king that sat on the throne of that southern kingdom in the lineage of David until Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And that's why I believe he chose Bethlehem. He chose the, the most insignificant place, the smallest place, for this king to be born, our king. And then you think about the shepherds. Why did he choose the shepherds? Why did he choose to make the announcement to the shepherds? He could have chosen anyone to make that announcement to. Why didn't he choose one of the priests, maybe the high priest in the temple, and they could have had all of this pomp, all of this, all of this ritual and stuff. I, you know, Aaron asked me yesterday, he goes, David, oh, by the way, what's going to be the title of, of your sermon today? And, and I just wrote back, I go, Christmas Day 2022? And, and I told him, I go, yeah, really, really uh, imaginative, right? And he goes, why, why, muddy, why muddy up the water? Why, why make something hard? You know, it's simple because he is simple, right? It's just Christmas Day 2022. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for you today? You know, so often we have all of, the, all of these Christmas parades and all of these pageants, and, and there's nothing wrong with all that. But let me tell you something. Long before, 2,000 years ago, long before there were ever Christmas lights on a Christmas tree or Christmas trees or presents or Christmas carols, 2,000 years before there were all these pageants and parades and all of this stuff celebrating the birth of Jesus, there was desperation. For a coming king. And shepherds? Shepherds were the lowest people on the social ladder. Shepherds would be right there with tax collectors. They would be right there with the prostitutes for these religious people, even when Jesus was born, for these religious people, these people, they weren't worth it. They were outcast. God doesn't love you. God doesn't want you. Matter of fact, I read somewhere where if a, if, a, uh, if a shepherd fell into a pit, they were such nobodies, uh, they, they, the, the word on the street was, eh, don't worry about them. Just walk on by. But yet this is who Jesus chose to make his announcement about his birth to was the shepherds.
And I believe that Jesus is making it very clear that at the very beginning, when he first came, God, Emmanuel, God with us, when he came to our planet, he wanted it to be very clear from that very beginning cry that came out of his body to the time that he was on the cross and he cried, it is finished. That his purpose in coming to this world was for us was to seek and save the lost. That's what he was all about. Luke 19.10, I was looking at that again, and, and you know, that's in the context of, of uh, Zacchaeus. You remember the wee little man, the tax collector that, that climbed up in a tree, and everybody was mocking Zacchaeus. What are you climbing up in that tree for? And, and he was saying, you know, Jesus is coming, and, and he couldn't see over people because he was a short little dude. And so he had to climb up this tree. And, and, and so he was talking to Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus could not believe that he would actually come to his house. And that's when Jesus told him that I have come to seek and save the lost. And you can see this in the very beginning when he first came to the shepherds for this very first birth announcement. He came to those that were desperate and knew that they needed a Savior. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about our, our Mark Bible study with the youth uh, group and then also the Zoom group and the Galena Park group, all of that. But I was thinking about, again, uh, in Mark chapter 2, whenever Jesus called Levi, when Jesus called Matthew, this tax collector, again, at the very bottom of the social ladder, and, and so Matthew was so excited about, you know what, I keep, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. And so he invited all of his friends to a dinner party, and he invited Jesus and his disciples to this dinner party that, that he was going to have, this celebration. And the Bible tells us that there were other tax collectors that were there and people that had disreputable uh, characters, and, and those are the kind of people that were among Jesus' followers. And so the teachers of the religious law and those that were so religious and so smug and looked down on others because, you know what, we're better than you are. God loves us. God doesn't love you. And so he was asked, they were asking Jesus' disciples, you know, why is he eating with such scum? Hello, that would be us. We would be the scum. And the sad part was, so were these religious leaders. But they didn't recognize it. They didn't realize it. And, and that's when Jesus told them in verse 17, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I'm not coming for the healthy. I came for sick people. And he goes ahead and he says, I have come to not call those who think they are righteous. See, they were thinking that they were righteous. They were thinking that God loves us. We are special to God. And Jesus says, you know what? I, didn't call, I, didn't, I did not come to those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And that's why Jesus came to the, the shepherds. I believe... I believe that's why he came out in where, where they were out in the fields. He didn't go to the temple. He didn't go to their church building. He didn't go with all of this pageantry and all of this ceremony and, and all of this kind of stuff going on. But he came to a group of people that were desperate. And they were not afraid to show they were in need. How about you? You see, unless we recognize, unless I recognize that I need today, I need Jesus coming to our planet. 
I need him to be born into our world. I need a savior. And if I don't recognize that, Christmas is just going to go right over my head. And it's not going to mean a lot. When I was growing up, and there's nothing wrong with any of this either, in my opinion, okay? Man, my mom and my dad, man, Christmas was special. We were poor, but you'd never know it. But Christmas, man, the presents, waking up. My brother and I, one time, getting up and thinking, oh, it's 6.30 in the morning. What are we doing still in bed? It's 6.30 a.m. And so we run out, and all of a sudden, my mom meets us down the hall. She goes, what are y'all doing up? We go, Mom, it's 6.30. What do you mean? And she goes, 6.30 is 12 midnight. We were looking at the clock upside down. Literally. But you know what? As I've gotten older, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding when talking about Sherry. I mean, she gets fired up about these gifts. She told me yesterday, because we've all our, our tradition has always been to, to open our stocking on Christmas Eve. Boy, yesterday, I mean, when are we, we going to do the stockings? David, just you and me, when we're doing the stockings, we'll do it like we always do. And we always read, "Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. And we also read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. That's been our tradition ever since we have been married. But as I've gotten older, I love just sitting and looking at the Christmas tree in the dark, in the night, especially after Sherry's already gone to bed and it's quiet, and just spending time with God and thanking God because I know I need a Savior. So this Christmas, Recognize that he came to you. He came to me. And I pray today and every day that, you know what, man, I am desperate for Jesus. I don't begin any day of, of my life here, I don't know for how many years now, desperate for Jesus. And so that's why I want us to take the Lord's Supper right now. Because Jesus came He chose you. He chose me. He chose our mess. And even though you and I we still sin and we still mess up he says, man, you, you walk in the light. You trust Jesus. And if you'll do that, man, my blood is going to continuously cleanse you from all of your sin. You will be pure. And he gave us this time. Right before he was crucified, right before the trial, he gave us this time as his followers to remember him. Don't ever forget And so even though we're celebrating his birth today, don't ever forget that from the beginning of that first cry to his last cry on that cross, his life was about seeking and saving the lost. So Jesus, I just want to say thank you. Man, I am so amazed and so blown away the more I look at your coming, the more I look at the, the way that you came and who you came to and everything that was going on in our world and how big of a mess the world was that you were born into. And so many times it's easy for us to get discouraged as we look at the mess of our world. We look at the brokenness 
We look at the evil. We look at the evil that is done to the vulnerable people and those who are not able to defend themselves. But Jesus, you came for us. And you stepped right and, were, and you were born right into our messes to give us hope, to give us life. So Jesus, thank you. As we take the fruit of the vine, Lord, that cup that you passed around that night with your followers. They didn't understand what, what was really going on. They didn't understand for a while what was going on. And what was what 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 that cup that you passed around to them telling them that, that this is your blood, this new covenant. But with your Holy Spirit, they began to understand what this meant. And I pray, Lord, today,